Well, good morning. Could you imagine if there were no traffic laws? Uh, that's not Route 1 and 198, but it could be some Friday afternoons. I've been out there. And uh, why do I play that video? Because we're in a series uh, talking about the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever preached. And, uh, you know, today we're going to talk a little bit about how do I change. And I show you that video because some people believe and have this idea that when Jesus came on, on this earth, that uh, all the Old Testament laws were abolished. Or the Old Testament is no longer in play for New Testament Christians. So I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles, please, Matthew chapter 5. If you're a guest, welcome. It's good to see you. And uh, take a deep breath. We're glad you're here. And uh, we're, we're a church that believes in the Bible, that preaches the Bible, that seeks to make disciples of all men from every tribe, tongue, nation. And uh, it's great to have you here this weekend. And uh, we're going to look today at just four verses as we actually continue the second week in our series in Matthew chapter 5. Let me just set the context for you. Jesus is teaching his disciples and a large group of, of Jewish people, and he's basically asking them this question. How do we experience joy in life? How do we experience freedom? How do we change and I want you to notice with me in verses 17 to 20, like he tells us the path to get to joy and change. Follow along. Verse 17, he says, Don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth shall pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. You know, for the Jewish people, the law and the prophets refers to the scriptures of the Old Testament. If you were a Jewish man, uh, you probably had the first five books of the Old Testament memorized. Like, you would know this inside and out. And what's interesting, you know, when we think of the word law, I wonder what you think of. Do you think of rules, like a list of rules? Do you think maybe going uh, to a courtroom? Do you think how your teenager just always like breaks the rules? But for the Jewish people, when, when they would hear the word law, they would also hear the word covenant. For us, when we hear the word covenant, we probably think of like a marriage covenant. A covenant says, I will keep my word even if you don't keep your word. God told his people, he says, you know, I will be your God and you will be my people. And we know all the time they didn't listen to that. See, there's a difference between a covenant and a contract. And when Jesus says, I've not come to abolish the law and the prophets, I've come to fulfill them, he's saying, I have come to fulfill the covenant that God has made. They, they would not be thinking Jesus is talking about a whole lot of rules. They would hear Jesus talking about he's come to bring a relationship of change, a relationship of freedom. Just like those listening to Jesus, I think many times we struggle that God has made a covenant with us. We struggle to believe that when we sin, that God will still love us and forgive us. Like, I think this is why it takes us sometimes so long for us to, to confess our sins and to ask God forgiveness, because when we sin, we feel dirty and we feel gross, and we need some space between us and God before we start to pray again or before we start to read our Bibles again. But if we understand the covenant that God has through us through Jesus, no matter what we did, we would walk right into his throne room, wouldn't we? Which makes what Jesus says in verse 19 so amazing. Look at it with me. It says, therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. Here's what's so incredible about that verse. Like the scribes and the Pharisees would have been sitting there. They are the religious elite of the first century. 
We know they had the Old Testament. We know they had the Ten Commandments. All of you know the Ten Commandments. But in addition to those Ten Commands, there were an additional 613 commands. Imagine that. 613 commands to keep you from breaking the Ten. You might say, what were some of those? Things like, uh, on the Sabbath, we know you're not supposed to work. And they would say, here's how far you can walk without it being work. That sounds kind of oppressive, doesn't it? But let's be honest, like this is exactly what we do. What's really a sin? How far can I go without sinning? Like how many words can I say without it actually like swearing? Or we say things like, uh, you know, that really isn't a swear word. So like, I don't know what you do, but I don't have to put anything in the swear jar or whatever, whatever you do, all right? Teenagers, like, we especially do this kind of thing. Like, I know there's sin. I know there's the line. I'm going to get, like, as close to the line as I possibly can get without stepping over it. Uh, I've been with church people. They they say things like this sometimes. You know, a righteous person reads their Bible this many times. And they, like, give this much money away. They, They pray this much. They dress a certain way for church. Or like they serve this much. All of these categories, none of them are necessarily wrong, but you don't really need Jesus for any of them. You know, you can go and volunteer all these hours, serve a nonprofit. You don't need Jesus for that. You can give everything away in your bank account today. You don't need Jesus for that. I mean, you can dress to the nines. You don't need Jesus for that. Like, I'll even say this, you don't need Jesus to pass a Bible exam. Do you understand that? Like, I know atheists or agnostics who know more about the Bible than people who've been in church for 10 years. Like, you see, we can know all kinds of things about the Bible and about God and not actually be transformed by Jesus. Like, that's exactly what the Pharisees are doing I'm this good, I do these things, I look good on the outside, I have my act together, I don't have any big sins. But notice in the text that we read, Jesus said this, if your righteousness does not exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, and the group sitting there is probably sitting, there's no way we can exceed their righteousness. I mean, they got the Ten Commandments, they got them all down, they got the 613 laws. I mean, they, they, they are super religious people. Like, these are, these are the ones who post the verse of the day first on social media with their coffee mug. You know some people like that? I can't compete with that. George uh, Whitfield, the great evangelist from a couple centuries ago, here's what he said. He said, we must learn not only to repent of our sins, but we must also repent of our righteousness. So the question is, how do we change I'm going to look at three headings this morning along these lines. The first is devote yourself to Scripture. You're like, well, that's basic Christianity right there. But look at verse 17. When Jesus talks about the law and the prophets, that's the way they said Bible in those days. What he is after here is that comprehensive receptivity to all of Scripture. He's saying to his hearers, you and I, we have to stop treating the Bible like a menu and start treating it for what it is, an owner's manual. And God's the owner. You know, we're still kind of in the new year. We're still in January. And and I've been talking to various people and I've been asking them, uh, hey, it's not too late. Like, what are you doing for your Bible reading? What what are you doing for for, to be in Scripture? You might say today, like, why, why do I as a Christian need to read the Bible? Why is that important? Because when we read the Bible, it shows us who God is. It shows us all of his attributes. It creates a, 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 it fosters a love for God. Maybe you're here and you don't know what to read when it comes to Bible reading. You're like, where do I start? Do I start on page one? Uh, I probably wouldn't recommend that. If you're, if you're new, I would suggest uh, Gospel of John. 
Uh, take the Gospel of John. It's the fourth book in the New Testament. I would start there, and I would start reading. You're like, well, how much should I read? Well, that just depends on like how much time you have, how much you can comprehend. Uh, maybe you can just read a few verses. Maybe you want to read a whole chapter. Uh, maybe you're real ambitious. You want to read multiple chapters. But but I would encourage you. You know, start to read the Bible. You might say, well, I've read the book of John. Where do I go next? Maybe the epistles, the letters of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Maybe after that, you want to go back to the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Maybe you want to read the book of Romans. Maybe you're, you're like, love rules, and uh, you can't get over your little Pharisee ways. Maybe what you should read is the book of Galatians where uh, you know you've been set free by Christ and you need to dig in there. Maybe you don't have joy in your life. Maybe you need to read the book of Philippians. But here's the, here's the point. The point is, get in the Scriptures. Read. Get to know God better. And we have to stop pr- the practice of picking and choosing. You know, there are churches, I won't name them, of course, but there are churches, they like cherry-pick verses, and they put this verse and that verse, and everyone gets all exhilarated, and there's, there's like hard parts of the Bible that they won't even touch. Now, maybe because I'm just uh, stupid or something or crazy, I don't know what it is, but uh, there, there isn't a passage or a part of the Bible I won't touch. I mean, I think as, as a church, we ought to be able to teach and preach the whole counsel of God, even the parts that are a little uncomfortable. Uh, we shouldn't be scared. We should dive in. We don't need to cherry pick verses and make everything light and fluffy. And everybody walks out saying, oh man, I feel so much better. You know, I'm ready to conquer the world. Because sometimes uh, we read scripture and it isn't, it isn't so warm and fuzzy. See, we need to stop picking and choosing like God is our consultant. You know, this is actually a test of discipleship. This is the test. What do you and I do with the hard parts of scripture? What do you do with the parts of the Bible that contradict you? What do you and I do with the parts of the Bible that contradict culture, that contradict your feelings, that contradict your post-enlightenment insights or your pre-enlightenment legalism? What do you do with the parts that are hard and that push back on you? See, that's a test of discipleship. Mark Twain, do you know who Mark Twain was? If only Mark Twain had access to Twitter back in the day. But this is what he said. I'm going to put it up here. He says, it ain't those parts of the Bible that I can't understand that bother me. It's the parts that I do understand that bother me. You'll hear it said in this post-enlightenment, largely feeling-driven and lesser principle-driven approach to faith, I hear people say things like this, I love Jesus. I'm all in with Jesus. I just don't like the God of the Old Testament. Here's the problem. The Old Testament God is Jesus. Jesus is the Old Testament God just as much as He is the New Testament God. You're like, well, how can you say that? Well, Luke chapter 24, it says, Jesus was with a couple of His disciples. He opened up the Scriptures beginning with the Law and Prophets, and He explained everything in the Scriptures about Himself. See, anytime you and I say that Scripture is not consistent with my Jesus is the moment that you and I cease to follow Jesus altogether. See, if you are only following part of Him, you are following none of Him. You are following yourself. That's all that you're following. You're putting yourself in the position of being judged over the Creator and over your Maker. That is really dangerous. It is really dangerous for the pottery to say to the potter, you have made me, but now I'm going to remake you. That's very dangerous, but we do it all the time. Tim Keller, who's a New York Times bestselling author, former pastor, he says this. He says, are you sifting through the Bible deciding what you like and what you don't like, or are you letting the Bible sift through you, deciding what it doesn't like and what it it does like? Which is it? Either it's an authority over you or you are an authority over it. And if there's anything that you dislike about Scripture, what that means is you haven't put yourself in a position to judge any verse. Reject part of it, that means you're following none of it, no matter what you tell yourself. See, this is part of being a pastor I don't like. 
I'm reading my Bible, you know, since the new year started, I got this new plan I'm working on. I'm reading four chapters a day, and every single day as I read my Bible, it pushes back on me. I don't like some of the stuff I'm reading. I mean, it opens all kinds of things up, and it makes me question things, and, and it, it, it really hits me right, right to my heart and my being and my character and who I am. So the question is, are we going to read the Bible, or are we going to yield and let it read us? I mean, that's the question. I mean, there's a lot at stake based on the answer to that question. The Apostle Paul writes to young protege pastors named Timothy and Titus in some of his later letters, and one phrase that he uses to both of those young pastors is this, sound doctrine. He emphasizes the need to practice sound doctrine. Preach the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. And you know, the Greek word for sound means healthy. Have, have you ever noticed this? Like, like healthy is hard. Do you realize that? I mean, we have, you know, some of you made New Year's resolutions to eat better, to exercise more, to sweat more. I mean, healthy, healthy is hard. The other day, I, I, I decided January 1st that I wasn't going to eat fast food and just see how long I could go. I mean, I'm a fast food junkie. I mean, it's awful. I mean, you name it, Whoppers, uh, you know, anything, you know. I'll, I'll deep fry anything. And uh, I determined January 1st, like, no more. I'm going to see how long I can go without fast food. So the other day, I think it was Thursday, and uh, I came in here. And the other thing I've been trying to do is I've been trying to, you know, some of you are going to yell at me, I know. But I've been trying to cut out a meal a day. So I've gone from three meals to two. And um, I've been, so Thursday, I came in. I didn't eat breakfast. I came into the office. And uh, I got busy, 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 didn't eat lunch. And uh, it's like 2, 3 o'clock, it's rolling around. And uh, Pastor Brian, I'm going to blame him as my stumbling block. Uh, he, look at him, he's like, no, no, no. Uh, he, he was getting some work done on his car. So he says, uh, my, car's, my car's done, can you, can you run me down to, to a manual shop? And uh, so I said, uh, sure, I'll run you down there. And uh, so I, I, I drove down there and... The whole time we're talking, talking, all I can think about is food. And I started to like justify in my mind like, uh, oh, I can just cheat. You know, you read about people having cheat days. Can I have a cheat meal right now? And, uh, and I thought, you know, uh, I'm going to go a different way back to church. Uh, I'm going to go down Route 1 and turn on Conti and there's Chick-fil-A right there. And... Uh, man, it was a problem. Like, it was like restraint. It was like a battle between the flesh and the spirit. And I, I, I had put myself in that path, so I, I, I know what was coming. And so uh, uh, I made it, all right? I didn't stop. I didn't eat. Uh, so I missed lunch that day. I went home and had dinner. But you know, being healthy is hard. January 1st, many of you made resolutions. Surveys show that 80% of all people who make resolutions on January 1st fall off the wagon by Valentine's Day. So some of you got three weeks to go to make it into the 20, to make it into the 20%, all right? Good luck with that, and then when you make it, you'll become arrogant and it won't matter anyway, right? Because you're gonna start comparing yourself to other people who didn't make it. You know, Ed Miller, who is uh, the dean of Johns Hopkins Medical School, says this, more than 70% of bypass patients revert to unhealthy behavior in two years. They go back to the stuff they know will kill them. You know, it's the same thing when we revert back to the old self instead of moving forward with the new. When we revert back to the flesh instead of moving forward with the spirit. When we revert back to, to self-righteousness rather than moving forward with the covering of righteousness with Jesus. So here's what I want to ask you to do this morning. Take your least favorite part of the Bible. For each of us, it'll be different. And can I just say this? It is permissible to have a least favorite part. If you don't have parts of the Bible you don't like, you've never really obeyed God. Because the nature and essence of obedience is to do things you don't want to do. 
So take your least favorite part. Maybe that's what the Bible says about sexuality, what the Bible says about money and generosity, what the Bible says about hell, what the Bible says about judgment, what the Bible says about all people, no matter their color or social status. All people are made in God's image. What the Bible says about sin, yours and mine. What the Bible says about the exclusivity of Jesus, that no one comes to God but through Him. What Bible says about the inclusivity of Jesus, that He loves and embraces people you don't like, and He calls us to treat them as family. See, healthy discipleship always defers to Isaiah 58. Do you know what Isaiah 58 says? It reminds us, that God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways all the time. And if we knew everything that God sees and knows, the smallest stroke of any letter that we're looking at here in Matthew 5 of the Scriptures would both look good to us and feel good to us because it's healthy. So devote yourself to Scripture. Here's a second thing I see from Matthew 5 in this passage Dismiss your inner Pharisee. You are aware, are you not, that each of us has an inner Pharisee? You know, it's easy to be in church your whole life and not know God. To put all your confidence in keeping the rules. Now, I've told some of you before from this from this platform, like I had to keep lots of rules when I was growing up. And it was like the first three decades of my life, my first 30 years, like I was pastoring churches and I was trained and I was with a group of people and I was, was with folks who believed like I believe. And, and here were some of the rules, like don't wear these clothes, you know, make sure your hair's all high and tight, nothing touching your ears, nothing on your collar. Uh, make sure you have a shirt on with a collar. If your shirt doesn't have a collar, mm -mm. Uh, women couldn't wear pants. I couldn't basically listen to any music with a drum beat. Now look at me, right? Um, Like, this is crazy stuff. But growing up, we had all these rules to protect us, but really what it was is it was self-righteous legalism. No one really believed that the heart could be changed, so we have to let our rules be the thing that we submit to. Now, I worked hard. I worked hard to fit into those rules, and I did. And when I was going strong, man, I was so full of pride. But I knew, like, down deep it was just a facade. Eventually, I became bitter because I was living under this load that I knew I couldn't live up under, and I started to despise church leaders and friends. I was even a pastor at one one point in this. I just got tired of the game. It It was a game. It was like I was on this wheel all the time. Couldn't get off the wheel. It wasn't life giving, it wasn't the fruit of the Spirit, it wasn't love, joy, and peace. I resigned to the fact life could never be the way the Bible says it's supposed to be. So I'm just going to suffer through this life. I'm going to die, and then I'll experience what it should be. I didn't want to be like some of my friends who grew up in the church and walked away and screwed up their lives. Some didn't come back to church. Others did. But when they came back, it was with all this baggage. Like, that was my life as a Christian adult until I looked at Scripture with new eyes. I started trusting in the sovereignty of God and living for His approval. No longer held hostage by the approval of everyone else. I was going to take all my beliefs, every belief I had been taught for three decades, and I was going to systematically run them through Scripture. My practices then were going to stem from my beliefs, and I was not going to let my practices rule over my beliefs. See, when God started changing my thinking, I wanted to follow Him, not because people would be impressed by me, but I wanted to please Him. And I wanted it to start from internal, from inside of me, to external. I wanted to follow my king. I wanted to obey him. I wanted to find joy in doing it. And when I don't, I know that God created me for good works and wants me to flourish in those good works. So what's the righteousness that he's talking about here in Matthew 5? He says, the righteousness of the Pharisees. What is that? 
Well, first of all, there's a religious version. Just by like way of summary, here's the religious version. It sees laws as a duty, external compliance as righteousness. Like there's no romance to it. There's a heart that's disconnected and disengaged and emotionally distant. The soul is not electrified. It's a chore. It's like the Smith Barney way. When I, you know, about 20 years ago, Smith Barney was an investment firm that was on TV all the time. Now it's Morgan Stanley. But you know, sometimes Christians adopt the Smith Barney way. We move forward in the kingdom of God the old fashioned way, Smith Barney used to say. We earn it. See, the philosophy of life for the Pharisee, very interestingly, is very Buddhist. You may have heard or read one time the Buddha's dying words on his deathbed were, strive without ceasing. What a stark contrast to the final words of Jesus, it is finished. You see, for the Pharisee, the law of God represents pressure. Keep up, buck up, make it into kingdom the old-fashioned way by earning it. Pressure's on. See, for the Christian, the law represents freedom. The law says, here's the way. Walk in it. Pursue health. Pursue the very best version of what God wants you to be, which you'll find in the end is the very best version of who you want to be. See, that's the religious version. But then there's the non-religious version. This is probably more susceptible to us in our type A career-driven environment that we're all in. You know, there are so many great things accomplished by a type A mentality. Obviously, I'm type A, if you haven't figured that out. But, you know, there's, there's baby and bathwater here. The baby is, you're changing the world in great ways. The bathwater is, though, you're susceptible to turning your performance into your life-defining metric into the thing that's, that makes you successful, into the thing that makes you say on the end of the sentence, I will be okay if dot, 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 or I won't be happy until dot, dot, dot. It's that life-defining metric. If it's something other than Jesus and what he's accomplished and what he's finished, we're screwed. Do you see that? We, we are up a creek if our life-defining metric is based on our own performance, on our own record, on our own righteousness. You know, there are lots of potential culprits. Your own children. You know, when you pour your identity into your own children, when your happiness is going to depend on how they turn out, how they behave, what kind of grades they make, what kind of university they get into, you are reversing the flow of the umbilical cord. You are demanding that your children be your Jesus. No little person should have to bear that burden. No big person should have to bear that burden, much less a little person. There are other potential culprits, good looks, romance, net worth. Like you may remember the the famous quote from the actor Jim Carrey when he said, I hope everyone can get rich and famous and have everything they have ever dreamed of so they'll all know that's not the answer. Maybe you know what Jim Carrey says is true, but you just want to discover it for yourself. See, career is a potential culprit too, isn't it? I'm going to ask you this question, and uh, no one's getting kicked out of church, so we had a bunch of chickens in the first service, but uh, I'm going to, there, there were three or four people that had integrity, a bunch of other chickens. Um, how many heavy metal fans do we have in the crowd? Heavy metal. All right, yeah. You're all looking around. The Pharisees are looking around, all right? <laughs> all right, we got some heavy metal fans, all right. 1983. A heavy metal guitarist is kicked out of the band that he's a part of with no warning and no reason. The band members got together and they decided that they wanted him out. This was uh, right after the band signed their very first record deal, right after they reached the thing they'd been working for for years. So he got on a bus, he rode all the way across the country from New York City to L.A., and he vowed on that bus trip to start a new band that would be so successful that the band that kicked him out would ever regret kicking him out. He worked very, very hard. He became legendary. He did form that new band. Their first record went all the way to gold. The guitarist's name, I'm going to put a picture of him up, was Dave Mustaine. There's Dave. 
he founded the heavy metal band Megadeth. That's a band that sold over 25 million albums. Dave Mustaine alone has a net worth of $20 million. He is now known as one of the most influential musicians in heavy metal music. He is a living legend to the 12 of you that raised your hands and millions of other people, all right? So what was the name, that, name of the band that fired him? Metallica who has sold over 180 million albums. Mustaine had a, had a very public interview in 2003. He broke down into tears in the middle of the interview, and the interviewer said, Dave, why are you weeping? You're one of the most successful musicians in the history of music. And Mustaine's tearful reply in a moment of tenderness was this. He says, I still consider myself a failure. He says, I'll always be known as the guy who got kicked out of Metallica. Why do I tell you that story? Because all forms of righteousness based on our own performance and based on our own life-defining metric, if that metric is outside of Christ and what he's done, will lead to some form of contempt. Either contempt toward others as we feel superior, morally superior, social network superior, grade point average superior, athletically superior, you fill in the blank. Or we'll have contempt toward God because we feel like we have lived a good and virtuous life and we feel like he's given us a lot less than we deserve. He's given us less than what he owes us. Guess what? God owes us nothing. You entitled brat. God owes you nothing. Nothing. And yet he's given us everything in Christ. Stop holding God in contempt. We are up the creek unless we discover our true righteousness by renouncing our own. Here's the last thing I want to look at. We need to discover our true righteousness. Verse 17, look at it again. It's not up to you. It's up to me, Jesus said, to establish your righteousness. The path of your righteousness is through your own unrighteousness. That's how you get to true and perfected righteousness. I'm reminded about Leonard Cohen, who's the Canadian songwriter. He says there's a crack in everything, and that's how the light gets in. See, that includes you. It includes the crack in you, exposing the crack. That's the way the light gets in. That's how you change, renouncing your own unrighteousness. Your life-defining metric then becomes Jesus' record, and you're united with Christ by faith. And being united with Christ in faith, everything that is true of Jesus in the eyes of the Father is now true of you because of what He has done for you. He's taken the pressure off of you and taken it upon Himself. Brennan Manning writes, and he's the author of Ragamuffin Gospel. If you've never read Ragamuffin Gospel, you should read it. He says this, the kingdom of God belongs to people who aren't trying to look good or impress anybody, even themselves. They're not plotting how they can call attention to themselves, worrying about how their actions will be interpreted, or wondering if they'll get gold stars for their behavior. The child of God doesn't have to struggle to get himself in a good position. He doesn't have to craft ingenious ways of explaining his position. He doesn't have to create a pretty face for himself. He doesn't have to achieve any state of spiritual feeling or intellectual understanding. All he has to do is happily accept the cookies, the gift of the kingdom. See, the way that you and I exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees is to repent of our own sin and to repent of our own righteousness. That's how you exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Then you'll be clothed with Jesus. And then you will start to recognize that you are clothed with his righteousness, not your own. And when you do, your religion becomes less of a theory and more of a love affair. And even the hard parts of Scripture will start over time sounding healthy to you. Thanks be to God. Amen for his perfect righteousness. If you're here today without Christ, you're never gonna be able to live up, no matter how good you are, to the perfect standard of God. 
You need to repent of your sin, but you also need to repent of your righteousness. There are some of you here today that, that are Christians, but man, you love your rules. You're like a Pharisee walking around. Don't do this, don't wear that, don't walk that way. Listen, why won't you lay all that down and just trust in the righteousness of Christ? Like, why do you keep fighting? Why do you keep pounding against the pricks? As he said to the Apostle Paul, what you and I need to do is we need to lay down all for the righteousness of Christ. 